Okay, hi everyone. Um, can if someone could just let me know if you can hear me okay, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Great, thank you. Um, so, hi everyone, and welcome to Mold Prevention, Detection, and Response. Um, I am Jillian Marcus, which uh, Diani just said, um, and I'm the Preservation Specialist for DIPSNY, which is the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York Initiative uh, for New York State. Um, but I am here today, which is great. So um, as I'm sure everyone here knows, mold on heritage collections is a huge topic, um, but we'll try to touch on some of the big issues during today's webinar. If you are at all squeamish, um, and I have to admit that I am I am squeamish, um, this might not be the most pleasant topic, but it's really important, so we're just going to go ahead and dive in. So today we're going to touch on mold origin and growth, um, what it is, where it comes from, and why we don't want it growing on our heritage collections. Um, we're going to talk about mold prevention, how to keep it from occurring in the first place, mold detection, how to determine if you have a mold problem, the extent of the problem, um, and whether the mold is active or inactive, mold response, how to deal with a mold situation safely for both objects and people, and uh, when to get help, so how and when to get experts such as mitigation firms and conservators um, involved. So we all know what mold is, um, but it's worth taking a deeper look at where mold originates from, as well as the structure, life cycle, and reproductive cycle of mold. Mm. Um, so mold is everywhere at all times. We can't completely eradicate it, nor would we want to. Um, mold is necessary for many of the environmental processes that we take for granted, including the breakdown of dead animal and plant tissue, um, and the release of nutrients needed to support living things. We also have many beneficial byproducts from mold, including penicillin and cheese. So we're glad that mold is here, just maybe not in our collections. Um, a quick fact, uh, one cubic meter of outdoor air may contain one million spores. Um, inside a moldy building, it can be 10 times that number. Right now, at this very moment, um, both you and I are breathing in approximately 600,000 mold spores every hour um, without, without thinking about it. So personally, I try really hard not to, th to think about that fact, but mold is all around us. Um, so how does it get into our heritage collections? Well, it's already there. Um, it's also carried in on dusty surfaces, um, in food and on fresh flowers and plants, which is one reason why we recommend that food, plants, and flowers are kept out of collections areas. Sometimes an object has inherent vice, um, where contamination has occurred during the object's production. Uh, an example of that would be mold spores getting into the pulp fat um, at a paper making factory. Um, and then those mold spores um, becoming active later on in the paper's life. An object may have been contaminated during use, uh, for example, outdoor exposure, improper storage, etc. Mold can sometimes come into a collection from an object which is donated or acquired. Um, if a moldy book, for example, is brought in from outside and the conditions are right, that mold will begin germinating and it can spread to the rest of the collection. The majority of the fungi that grow on the surface of heritage objects are conidial fungi. Um, <clears throat> and the most successful of the conidial fungi, what we tend to see in our heritage collections, is from the order Eurotials. Um, they are commonly found on archival, library, and museum collections, and they're also food contaminants, so they can make you sick that way too. Um, However, this order also produces antibiotics, for example, penicillin, as well as the immunosuppressant um, cyclosporine, which is used to help people who have had organ transplants by preventing rejection of the donated organs. So while we don't want them anywhere near our food or in our collections, they do have their place in the world, um, and we should be glad they exist. However unpleasant they may make our jobs in conservation or preservation. Um, I've uploaded a brief glossary of mold-related terminology with a little bit about the stages of mold germination. Mold reproduction is incredibly complex, so I'm just going to very briefly talk about the way <clears throat> mold reproduces. Mold reproduction and germination can vary depending um, upon the mold species. The mold that tends to become part of heritage collections reproduces um, through the following way, and, and again, this is, this is a simplified explanation. Um, a conidium germinates and produces a vegetative stage in which hundreds of new conidia are produced. 
Um, so breaking that down, mold hyphae, which are the kind of fuzzy hair-like things that you see on mold growth, um, disseminates large numbers of canidia, which become airborne and land on new surfaces. And when I say um, when I say canidia, that refers to um, a spore which is produced by asexual reproduction. So canidia is the same as uh, same as a spore. It's just reproduced uh, reproduction um, through asexual means. Same thing. So if the conditions are right, um, a spore will germinate. Hyphae will then sprout. Those are those kind of hair hair like um, structures, and these produce spore sacs that burst letting the spores into the air. So um, that's basically how the mold that we're dealing with in heritage collections reproduces. A mass of hyphae um, is called a mycelium, and this mass is what you're looking at when you see a moldy spot on bread or cheese. By the time you can actually see a spot um, or a patch of mold, um, you're actually looking at the mycelium, so that's quite a lot of hyphae um, <clears throat> in one place. If you really, really um, want to get waste deep into the world of fungal reproduction, um, and who wouldn't want to do that, um, I highly recommend a book called Fungal Facts, Solving Fungal Problems in Heritage Collections by Mary Lou Florian. Um, it's currently the go-to guide for understanding mold in library, archive, and museum collections, and although it's dense, it has a really incredible amount of helpful information, um, and I'll put, up, I'll put up a link to that later on. The main reason that we're so concerned with mold growth in collections is that mold is attracted to many of the materials that make up the objects in our archives, um, museums and libraries. So this includes starches, which are found in adhesives, sizings, and cloth, um, proteins including leather, parchment, gelatin, animal glues, and photographic emulsions, cellulose, which um, is part of wood furniture, uh, wooden objects, and frames, uh, as well as making up paper and books. Mold also grows in some of the everyday debris, which um, kind of lands in any collection. So this can include things like skin cells, clothing fibers, external dirt, oily secretions such as fingerprints, um, and industrial pollutants. Mold causes harm to archival and library materials by landing on a substrate and beginning to digest the material components. Mold secretes um, hydrolytic enzymes in order to break down the substrate, and by the substrate I mean the paper it lands on, the book it lands on, um, the textile. That's what I'm referring to when I say substrate. Um, so these enzymes are secreted in order to break down that material into simpler substances, which can then be absorbed by the hyphae, and those are those hair-like structures. That's how the mold actually obtains um, its nutrients. So the resulting degradation weakens materials, um, which makes them susceptible to further damage, and it also means that materials end up absorbing water more readily. So after a mold infestation, materials are more um, susceptible to damage from, for example, a water disaster or even just high relative humidity. Some molds contain colored substances that can cause staining even after the mold itself is removed from the object. The color of the powdery stuff, um, and that's the canidia, the spores, does not usually cause staining. It's actually the pigments which are excreted by the hyphae of the fungus that penetrates the surface of heritage objects and it causes a colored spot. So what we're concerned about um, is preventing the mold spores which are floating around us at this very moment from becoming active and beginning to damage our collections. <clears throat> In order to know how to control the activation and growth of mold, we have to know um, what it likes. Mold has fairly basic requirements to become active, um, and two of the most important factors are the availability of an organic substrate um, and a source of moisture. And there are other things that it needs, but those are the two biggies. So if you've got an organic substrate for it to land on and you have a source of moisture, um, mold will be very happy. Some of the other factors that affect the ability of mold to grow and thrive in an environment are temperature, air circulation, pH, availability of nutrients, and light exposure. The availability of moisture is incredibly important for mold to grow um, and to flourish. 
Mold requires a moisture source to grow to produce enzymes that break down the substrate it lands on in order to obtain nutrients, and it also requires moisture in order to reproduce. Often when we talk about moisture levels in heritage collections, we think about relative humidity. Um, and high relative humidity is a very important factor to encourage mold growth, but the moisture content of the substrate the mold is growing on is also an important factor. This can help explain why two different types of material in the same environment can have different outcomes. Um, one might become moldy while the other doesn't. And um, for fungal decomposition of a substrate to occur, the moisture content of that substrate must be at least 20%. So all things being equal, if you have two objects and one has a higher, um, higher uh, moisture content, then that one is more likely to grow mold. Relative humidity above 70% um, and actually increases the likelihood of mold growth <clears throat> regardless. And at the same time, the mold will also thrive off of um, the moisture content of the substrate. So it, it gains moisture from, from multiple sources. Sources of moisture can include um, high relative humidity in the immediate environment, poor air circulation. Um, this can result in pockets of elevated relative humidity within a room, which seems to otherwise feel pretty dry. Usually the highest uh, relative humidity in a room is right next to the coldest surface. Um, so that includes next to windows, near the floor, next to an external wall. Um, and this coldest surface will be the location where condensation begins to form. Water from a flood um, or as a result of an activated fire suppression system can, of course, cause mold growth. And unfortunately, water from aqueous conservation treatments can also result in mold growth. Most mold will grow at temperatures between 59 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, <clears throat> however, mold growth can occur between 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature that mold prefers um, I'm sort of giving it human qualities here, but um, mold grows best um, around 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And that can vary, of course, based on other factors, um, uh, particularly um, relative humidity. But all things being equal, mold really likes to grow around 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It can actually lie dormant at sub-zero temperatures, um, and that is why we recommend freezing as one course of action for dealing with a mold outbreak. Um, however, there is a misconception that freezing kills mold spores, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. It actually, most of the time, just makes the mold dormant so that the mold can actually be um, physically removed. So activated or germinating conidia or spores can be killed by freezing temperatures um, and extremes in temperature, very, very high temperatures. Deactivated conidia actually become dormant under the same conditions. Hydrated conidia and living hyphae can be killed by freezing, but again, those um, those deactivated spores, they um, will just go dormant in frozen temperatures. So that's why we have to physically remove them, which we will talk about a little bit later. Air movement is very important, um, not only for regulating pockets of high relative humidity um, in space, but it also increases the evaporation and drying of moisture. All things being equal, um, good ventilation and air circulation can mean the difference between a mold bloom occurring on an object or not. So it's very, very important. A pH of 6 is optimum for most of the mold species that we deal with in our collections. Um, this means that mold tends to prefer a substrate which is just slightly acidic. A pH of 7 is neutral, um, so a pH of 6 just crosses into acidic territory. So mold likes that kind of mildly acidic substrate. Mold gains the nutrients it needs to grow and thrive from the substrates that it lands on. Um, as we mentioned before, mold produces enzymes which then break down archival and library materials as well as museum materials to obtain nutrients uh, such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, potassium, um, everything that's on the list up there, um, kind of like people. So this process is what weakens and damages the surface of collections materials. It's the, the process of obtaining these nutrients from a substrate. 
mold responses to light um, vary dependent, sorry, depending upon the species. So some mold is diurnal, meaning that growth accelerates in the dark and slows when the mold is exposed to light. Um, and that creates that concentric circle growth pattern that you sometimes see on mold and you can see in this picture. Um, other molds use light to actually aid spore production. So it really depends on the species. Um, and just as an aside, the photo of the mold that you can see here with those um, concentric growth patterns, that's actually the ceiling of a house in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Yuck, um, it's pretty gross. So to quickly sum up what we've discussed so far, um, in general, the higher the relative humidity, the more readily mold will grow. High temperatures, stagnant air, and storage spaces which are not environmentally controlled properly all contribute to mold growth. And to keep mold spores dormant, ideally temperatures should be kept below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity should be kept at 60%, 55 to 60% or below. So now that we know the factors which help and hinder mold growth, we can move on to assessing um, mold outbreaks in library, archival, and museum collections. Active mold is a stuff that we really worry about, um, and heritage materials with a mold infestation can't be properly cleaned without making the mold inactive first. You'll recognize active mold by the fact that it's often furry or fuzzy, um, as in this picture. Um, if you brush it with a soft brush, it will appear to smear, and it spreads rapidly. Inactive mold looks powdery and dry, and it's easily brushed from the surface that it's on without smearing. Sometimes, though, um, especially if you're feeling a little bit panicked about a situation, if you just discovered mold on one of your books, um, for example, it can be hard to tell whether the mold is active or inactive. So if you're very unsure, um, I think it's wise to assume that it's active just to be safe and take those precautions to avoid spreading it. Here are some examples of active mold on collections materials. On the left side is a book covered with fuzzy, furry, active mold. Um, that's an easy one to spot. There's no mistaking that for anything else um, except for active mold growth. On the right, um, you can see a moldy color slide. Um, and the web-like strands that you can see here are networks of hyphae, those, those thread-like structures radiating out of the growth center. And these are sometimes, um, these sometimes aren't perceived as mold. Um, it looks like maybe something's landed on the negative <clears throat> or it's been scratched, but these concentric kind of growth circles indicate that you've got active mold. Some mold can appear as uh, splotchy or dark discoloration uh, patches, which you can see in the gutter of the ledger um, that's in the photo on the left. On the right, uh, this is a cellulose acetate negative, which exhibits very distinct sites of circular mold growth. So you can see those little, those little circles or dots, and and those are active. That's active mold growth. Um, as a side note, mold really likes cellulose acetate negatives, um, and especially when relative humidity gets quite high where they're being stored. Um, this is a magnified photograph of a basket on the left side here. Um, you can see those spores really clearly. Um, mold which spreads in a closed book can cause staining that looks a bit like a Rorschach blot, um, those old psychological tests. There are lots of holes in this paper, which is another effect of a mold outbreak. Um, these are areas of loss which are caused when the mold um, actually weakens the paper structure and it deteriorates. And you can see here, since the book was closed, both the staining and the holes um, sort of mirror each other on each side. So there are some things which aren't mold, um, but can still give you a good scare by looking a whole lot like mold. Um, foxing is probably the most frequent of these. Um, it's a reddish brown mold-like staining. It most likely develops from contaminants which were introduced while the paper was being made. Um, it has a variety of potential causes. Some of them may be metallic, some of them uh, may be a microfungus, but they're not the type of mold that we are worried about. Um, one way to tell that this isn't an active mold growth is that the staining is embedded in the paper and it does not have a surface texture at all. So it can't be brushed away or shifted with a soft brush. Um, it's just completely flat and it's part of the paper. Dust can also look a whole lot like fluffy, furry mold. Um, and this is a case where you want to look at the patterns that the substance follows. 
mold tends to be more selective than dust um, in that it tends to follow moisture stains or fingerprints, for example. Dust will appear as a uniform coating, so it won't necessarily follow um, moisture lines, it won't follow fingerprints, things like that. It's worth noting though that mold can often be mixed with dust, um, and unfortunately dust can serve as a good food source for mold, so they often uh, cohabitate in the same space. Dirt can also resemble mold, but its distribution patterns are different. You want to be suspicious of uneven coatings of dirt um, and look for those thread-like hyphae under raking light, which is, is a, a light source um, to the side of your object. Dirt also tends to have distinct gritty particles, whereas mold will not show that, that type of structure. Um, unfortunately, again, dirt and mold also tend to kind of cohabitate in the same space. So if you do see quite a lot of dirt, it's worth also looking for mold growth. Um, tide lines can sometimes appear to be mold. In case anyone listening doesn't know what tide lines are, they are those discolored areas which appear when a material um, such as paper or textile is exposed to moisture or gets wet. The subsequent migration of dyes, dirt, or degradation products creates an area which tends to be lighter in the center and darker at the edges. Um, Tide lines are not going to move if you sweep them with a soft brush. They, they feel like part of the paper surface. Unfortunately, mold growth patterns do often follow tide lines um, because they are areas which were exposed to moisture. So if your tide line is furry um, or it appears to have some sort of particulate matter, you may also have mold growth along with that tide line or tide mark. Once you've determined that you do in fact have a mold outbreak, um, the response and recovery process should commence as soon as possible, um, but only after taking the time to, and care to make sure that health and safety procedures are followed carefully. So it's really important um, that you look after yourself before you begin addressing your collections. Some people are naturally very sensitive to mold um, and will probably know this already. Those people should for obvious reasons, not go anywhere near a mold outbreak um, or any kind of mold recovery operation. However, mold sens sensitivities can develop very suddenly and can cause severe complications. Um, that includes allergic reactions, asthma attacks, inflammatory reactions, um, things like that in the short term. To be honest, we don't really know the long-term effects of exposure to mold. Uh, we don't really fully understand those yet. People who have been through um, natural disasters can sometimes display delayed after effects from um, mold exposure, including effects on the central nervous system. So I'm not telling you this to scare you or to gross you out, um, although it is scary and gross, but it's to remind you why it's best to be prepared and protected in advance. If you don't feel that you can handle being involved in a mold recovery operation for health reasons, that is a fair choice. Um, People who have compromised immune systems or immune disorders should not enter a mold-infested area. People with diabetes or asthma and people who are taking steroids, um, as well as pregnant women, should not be involved in a mold recovery operation either. So health and safety comes before um, taking care of your mold-infested collections. The EPA, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, recommends levels of protection based on the size of the mold outbreak that you're dealing with. When in doubt, of course, um, you want to use more protection rather than less. So if you're really not sure um, about the extent of your outbreak, just assume it's bigger than it is uh, and take the proper precautions. Minimum protection is recommended for a mold outbreak covering a surface area of 10 square feet or less. This in, um, this uh, PPE would include an N95 respirator, nitrile or other disposable gloves, and safety goggles or another, um, another form of eye protection. Limited protection is recommended for a mold outbreak covering a surface area of 10 to 100 square feet or less. This includes an N95 respirator or half-face respirator with a HEPA filter, disposable coveralls, gloves, and eye protection. Full protection um, is recommended for a mold outbreak covering a surface area of 100 square feet or less. And this includes gloves, disposable full body coverings such as a, a Tyvek suit, headgear, shoe covers, and a full face respirator with a HEPA filter.
Um, and a HEPA filter um, is, I'm sure that you probably know, but it's a high efficiency particulate filter and it removes um, approximately 97 to 99.97% of particles down to 0 0.3 microns in size. Um, I do want to emphasize that if you're dealing with a mold outbreak that does is covering a very large surface area, you will most likely want to get the professionals involved instead of attempting to tackle it yourself. So here are two examples of respirators. Um, on the left, you have an N95 particulate respirator, which is disposable. And on the right, you have a half-face respirator with um, disposable P100 cartridges. P refers to particulate matter, while the number um, next to the letter refers to the approximate percentage of particles filtered out. So for example, a properly fitted um, respirator with P100 filters uh, filter cartridges will filter out 99.9% .9 of particles, 0 0.3 microns or larger. Um, and I also want to mention that it's very important to get a half-face or full-face respirator properly fit tested. Industrial hygienists in your area can assist you with this or can direct you to someone who is trained with respirator fit testing. <clears throat> um, and the American Institute of Conservation also can provide you with information on respirator fit testing. But it's important to get the proper fit um, insured so that the respirators actually work as they're intended to. In terms of cover-up PPE, um, you want to look for safety goggles, which are not ventilated. Um, you don't want those mold spores sort of getting in there and irritating your eyes. Full-body Tyvek suits are necessary for large active mold outbreaks um, or mold outbreaks in areas which may have raw sewage or other toxic and dangerous substances. Um, you can get Tyvek suits that are extra fancy and have attached shoe covers and full-length rubber gloves, um, but the standard issue Tyvek suits are also um, really good. Rubber or nitrile gloves are recommended anytime you come into contact with moldy material, um, no matter how large or small the outbreak is. So if you've had any disaster preparedness training or been through a natural disaster, you know that the first thing you need to do upon discovering an emergency situation is to stabilize the area. There are stabilizing techniques which are recommended, sorry, recommended um, <clears throat> the standard for discovering a mold outbreak. Um, the first step is to locate the source of moisture or humidity. It could be a number of things, a hole in the roof, leaky pipe, a broken window, could be a flooded basement. Um, it's very common for a mold outbreak to be triggered by an HVAC system issue or an HVAC system leak. You may find a very small mold outbreak on a shelf of books um, near an exterior wall, for example, or close to the floor um, that results uh, from condensation forming. Whatever the moisture source is, you want to identify it so that it can be corrected as soon as possible. Um, in a water emergency, you have approximately 24 to 48 hours before mold begins to grow. So once you have identified the source of moisture, um, you want to address it as soon as possible. If your institution has an HVAC system which can dehumidify the air um, and you've confirmed that it is not a source of mold contamination um, and has not been contaminated itself, uh, you want to turn that on unless it is thermostatically controlled or a fan coil system because those things can can make a, uh, the situation worse so they can actually begin to raise the humidity. Um, if you don't have an HVAC system or if your HVAC system appears to be the source of the mold contamination, um, which does happen, use what you've got. So open windows to get that air circulating, turn fans on at low speed, um, put portable dehumidifiers in the space. Um, and of course, you don't want to point any fans directly at affected materials because this can send mold spores airborne. The third step after addressing the humidity uh, or moisture source is to isolate affected materials. So um, if you have a very large outbreak, unaffected items can be placed in plastic bags and removed. Disposable materials should be packed in polyethylene bags, sealed and disposed of properly. If it's a smaller outbreak um, and more items are unaffected than are affected, then you can put the moldy items into plastic bags and transfer them to a treatment area, um, which of course you want to avoid leaving moldy objects in the plastic bag for a long period of time so you don't create that, uh, that microclimate and accelerate the mold growth. If it's a very large outbreak, you want to avoid moving affected materials out of the area.
um, and treat in situ if possible. And of course, um, if it's a very large outbreak, really your best course of action is to quarantine the area and get professional help. Close doors, um, hang plastic sheeting, and reduce air circulation from the affected area or room to other parts of the building to avoid mold spreading. Once you've stabilized the area, um, you can begin the process of inactivating and cleaning mold, which is the fun part if there's a fun part. Um, I guess, I know I keep saying this, um, but there are many occasions where you really do need to get an outside contractor involved. If you have a medium to large scale outbreak, it's very difficult to manage yourself um, unless you have a large staff with a lot of hands and a lot of available space um, to handle the situation. Toxic strains of mold or mold which is contaminated, um, sorry, rather combined um, with hazardous substances like sewage, things like that, that's that's unfortunately common. Um, that presents a situation that you really don't want to deal with yourself. In that case, it is imperative that you get an outside mold remediation company involved. They're trained, they've got equipment, they've got knowledge and experience to deal with um, what can be a very dangerous and stressful situation. Um, if you suspect that the HVAC system and your building itself are also moldy or, or the source of, source of the mold outbreak, um, the problem is likely serious and it's um, a really good idea then to get professional remediators involved. <clears throat> and very delicate, rare, or valuable materials should be taken for conservation treatment. You don't want to try to treat those yourself. Um, because trying to inactivate and clean mold on these materials can inadvertently destroy them. And finally, if you are just completely overwhelmed um, and you don't have the staff or resources to deal with a mold outbreak uh, within your institution, getting contractors on site will help to manage the situation and, and make things um, go a bit more smoothly. If you have a fairly small outbreak, there are several ways to deal with it in-house. Um, first, you want to inactivate active mold growth. You don't want to ever try to clean active mold because you'll just end up um, embedding it deeper into the paper fibers, for example, um, and spreading mold to other areas. So once the mold is inactive, um, you can begin the process of cleaning the items, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. The site of the outbreak must also be thoroughly cleaned, um, surfaces, floors, any area you suspect has come into contact with active mold. Stabilizing and cleaning moldy materials is really only half the battle because if you return them to an environment um, which is conducive to mold growth, you will very quickly end up with exactly the same problem or even a, a worse problem. The issues causing the initial outbreak have to be addressed and the environment must be very carefully controlled and monitored. Um, and we'll talk about each of those steps in detail as we go along. One important thing to note um, is the following procedures may inactivate mold growth. Um, however, these dormant mold spores will remain viable. So they're, they aren't dead, they are still around. This means that given the right environmental circumstances, mold spores will become active again. And that's why it's so important to ensure that you aren't returning these objects to a mold friendly environment. Um, and again, we'll talk about that a bit later. One of the most common ways to in inactivate mold is to freeze moldy material. Um, if mold has resulted uh, from a water emergency, freezing buys you time while you figure out what your next step is. Um, and it's also a good solution when you have a small amount of moldy material. If you have a lot of material which needs to be frozen, you will need to get a remediation firm involved. Um, although freezing is fairly convenient, not all materials respond well to being frozen. And that includes some photographic materials, um, such as case negatives, daguerreotypes, tin types, amber types, things like that. Paintings with thick layers of paint or varnish um, sometimes also do not respond well to freezing, so it's best to evaluate everything on a case-by-case -case basis. And a good mold remediation company will be able to advise you on that, um, as will the American Institute of Conservation, um, or I'm sure um, Diani or Samantha. Fungicides and fungus stats are not recommended anymore for collections, um, generally speaking. For extremely toxic mold species, outside professionals can use these for HVAC systems um, and for duct work. However, um, these really haven't been tested for long-term effects on permanent collections materials. So those chemical methods aren't really um, used very much anymore. 
conservators will always tell you to avoid UV light on your objects, um, except in the case of a mold outbreak. It sometimes becomes the lesser evil in that case. Either the sun or a UV lamp can be a good source of the UV levels necessary to inactivate and dry mold so that it can be removed. Um, because UV light can be very damaging to paper and photographic materials, it is recommended that exposure time is limited to less than 30 minutes. Desiccant drying is um, a service offered by vendors who pump moist or humid air out of the affected area and reintroduce dry air into the space. This is a really good solution for a dehydrating mold in situ if you have a very large outbreak um, in a contained space, for example, um, especially if the outbreak is fairly large. Um, it's expensive and it's obviously not feasible for every institution, but it is um, one alternative in order to um, inac inactivate a large amount of mold. Air drying is another way to inactivate mold on materials which have gotten wet. Um, it's really only for damp materials. So if you have very wet or soaked objects, air drying is probably not going to do what you want it to do. Um, it's good for small outbreaks and for materials which cannot be frozen or um, go through the desiccation process. Um, you have about a 24 to 48 hour window before most wet material um, begins to grow mold. Um, but if you've been through a water emergency, you will also know that air drying takes a great deal of space and time um, as well as manpower. So in the case of a small outbreak on damp objects, air drying is a viable option. Um, if it's anything other than that, it's going to be pretty tough and probably won't quite work out. Once you've inact inactivated the mold uh, through whatever method you've chosen, the next step is cleaning that inactivated mold, uh, those inactive mold spores, off of your material. You want to make sure that you're cleaning inactive mold spores. Um, again, active mold will smear, uh, might possibly become further embedded in your object, and it can spread. Um, you also don't want to clean mold, even inactive mold, off of pastels, charcoal drawings, corroded iron gall ink, or flaking paint. Basically anything which is friable, delicate, has a powdery surface um, or a flaking surface, and so something is easily damaged, rare, or valuable, it's the job for a conservator. Um, so you really, if when in doubt, if you don't think that you can handle the recovery process, um, get a conservator involved. Mold removal should be done either outdoors um, or indoors you're using a fume hood with a mold trapping filter. It's very important that you don't try to clean mold inside um, because you don't want to inadvertently spread active mold um, around the facility. <coughs> Pardon me. One of the most reliable ways to remove inactivated mold um, is with a vacuum with a HEPA filter, which we are going to talk about now. Any vacuum used for mold cleanup should not be um, a normal household vacuum. Aside from ca causing cross-contamination, a household vacuum, or for example, your workplace vacuum, will expel mold spores um, after vacuuming them. So um, the difference is that HEPA vacuums and vacuums with water bath filters um, will actually contain those mold spores so that they can be disposed of. For vacuuming the mold off of objects, um, a micro tool kit is available for HEPA vacuums, which has tiny precise parts um, for targeting specific areas, and it's great for, um, for doing mold recovery on collections objects. A vacuum aspirator is another very small tool, um, which is great for, for removing mold spores from an object. Because you don't want to vacuum um, directly uh, onto a drawing on paper, for example. Um, one suggestion is to vacuum through a fiberglass filter so that you don't cause damage or creasing or tears on your object. Another option is to uh, use a soft brush to gently dislodge those mold spores from the paper surface and direct them toward a small vacuum nozzle so that they can be picked up and removed. So you don't actually have to vacuum that surface directly. Any vacuuming should be done outside um, or under a fume hood with a mold filter. If you're worried that an object is too fra fragile um, to withstand being vacuumed, it's always best to consult a conservator before beginning. Um, another method of physical mold removal is to use a soot sponge, um, also known as a chemical sponge or a dry cleaning sponge that you see on the left there, to remove mold particles. Um, or you can use a um, vacuum with a brush attachment, as you can see on the right. And you want to make sure that the material is stable before you begin either process. Um, not that they're necessarily abrasive, but um, 
anytime you're touching an object repeatedly, you want to make sure that it can withstand that process. So once you've removed mold from the objects by inactivating it and either vacuuming it or um, using another physical method, uh, you then want to clean surfaces in the affected area, <clears throat> which may be harboring mold spores. So that includes floors, work surfaces, and shelves, which may have come into contact with moldy materials. You'll want to vacuum these surfaces with your HEPA vacuum um, to remove any residual mold spores. Uh, Non-porous surfaces can then be wiped with water uh, or water with detergent. One of the most common solutions is to use 40% um, isopropyl alcohol by volume and water. And isopropyl alcohol, um, you can find it in most pharmacies um, under the name rubbing alcohol. You want to make sure that all surfaces have a chance to dry completely um, before you return objects to these spaces. So once you've cleaned, let, let it dry very thoroughly so that you're not reintroducing moisture inadvertently um, to the objects that you're returning. And mitigating future risk um, really um, in the end is just as important as any initial remediation measures that you undertake. Um, going through the effort, the time, the cost, and the stress to remove mold from your collections is really pointless if you're um, then putting these objects back in an environment um, which has conditions that are conducive to mold growth. Mitigating the risk of a future mold outbreak requires a coordinate, coordinated excuse me, effort from the entire institution, um, and that includes planning and policy, establishing a segregated or quarantine area, um, consistent HVAC and building maintenance, proper storage, regular housekeeping, and maintaining appropriate environmental parameters. And these are all very important parts of preventing the reoccurrence of a mold outbreak in collections. Establishing the necessary policies to control risk um, is very important. It's one of the first things that you should do um, well in advance of any kind of outbreak. These policies include a solid emergency preparedness and response plan, um, which has provisions for dealing with fire, water, or other natural disasters, as well as a mold recovery plan. Ideally, your institution should have procedures in place for handling an incoming object suspected of a mold in, uh, infestation. And having that segregation and quarantine plan in place is really also important for um, dealing with pest infestations. So it's good for a variety of reasons. Maintenance and housekeeping plans will support a regular schedule of cleaning, inspecting, um, and building maintenance. And environmental monitoring plans will help direct a targeted approach to ensuring that the environment and areas collections are exhibited or stored um, are carefully monitored so that that environment is kept within recommended parameters um, to avoid a mold uh, outbreak in the first place. Regular inspection and cleaning of the HVAC system, including frequent changing of filters, is necessary to prevent and avoid mold occurring in a system um, which can, dis can bleh, excuse me, distribute it throughout a building. It's important to perform regular maintenance, um, and as basic as it is, checking of trouble areas to ensure that they don't develop into a larger issue. An example of this um, would be you know checking maybe a particular shelf which seems to have um, have mold growth or have objects with mold growth on it. It may be that there's a condensation problem there. Um, you also want to ensure good air circulation throughout the building and avoid pockets of stagnant air uh, where mold can grow. Regular dusting, keeping collections materials in boxes and enclosures, so keeping them kind of covered up when possible. Um, vacuuming floors instead of just sweeping or mopping them. Those are all fairly simple tasks which will make a huge difference in keeping collections um, completely mold free. Another important aspect of regular housekeeping is that it allows you to spend time checking on areas and materials you might otherwise not get a chance to examine. So it just gives you that kind of regular chance to get an eye on the collections. Um, and of course, keeping collections areas free from food, drink, and plants um, is important as these things can all contribute to a mold outbreak. One of the most crucial steps to avoiding another mold outbreak is to control and monitor your environment. Ideally, you want to keep that humidity below 55% and you want to keep temperature below 70 degrees Fahrenheit to ensure that mold is not reactivated. 
<clears throat> in order to make sure that you're carrying out an effective program of environmental control, you want to regularly monitor and record data, preferably by using an independent data logger. Even if you've got an HVAC system which monitors and records temperature and relative humidity, um, and those are great, it's important to have a separate independent device to monitor the environment. Um, the data logger will help you confirm that the data that you're getting from your HVAC system is correct, um, and it will also help you catch HVAC failures or inconsist sorry, inconsistencies. Data loggers are also good at helping to monitor pockets of storage which you know to be problematic. Um, if you've had a mold outbreak in a specific area of storage and you aren't sure why as you might be getting um, appropriate environmental readings for the rest of the storage room, installing a data logger in that space and monitoring that data will let you know if you're dealing with stagnant air, condensation, or some other issue um, which might make that particular part of the environment conducive to mold growth. And finally, proper storage is very important. Um, avoid storing collections in damp basements when possible. Store collections at least four to six inches off the floor. Um, avoid storage in areas with past leaks or poorly insulated um, exterior walls. Anywhere which has a tendency to be the site of condensation is going to be problematic for your collections and you want to avoid that. Um, if your institution has compact shelving, you may want to occasionally leave gaps in the shelving. Um, so when you sort of roll those out, leave a little bit of space between them to prevent the formation of pockets of stagnant air and to let air circulate in these spaces. Um, so we're almost done today, um, and I just wanted to point you toward the resources that I've uploaded with this webinar. Um, there's a CCHA guide to managing a mold invasion, NEDCC's guide to the emergency salvage of moldy books and paper, um, NHR's post-flood health and safety sheet, which is really great, a vacuum fact sheet for choosing and using a vacuum and heritage collections, and a brief glossary of basic mold terminology. Um, three additional resources I'd like to point you to include the EPA's Guide to Mold um, and AIC's Find a Conservator tool. And the search engine lets you identify the geographic area and type of material you're looking to treat, and it comes up with a list of conservators within these parameters. It's a really good place to start if you need a conservator to evaluate your collections after a mold outbreak. Um, or for any other reason that you might need a conservator. Um, maybe just to even get in touch with a conservator and find out what their services are before a mold outbreak even occurs. Um, and finally, I very much recommend Fungal Facts, Solving Fungal Problems in Heritage Collections by Mary Lou Florian. Um, it is a really great book to have on hand, particularly if you do have a collection um, which is prone to mold. So at this point, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, if you have uh, questions about the Regional Heritage Program, Diani can, um, can also answer those. And um, I'll take any, any moldy questions you might have. Um, so the slides, the presentation as a whole, uh, will be uh, posted on the website um, along with those resources. <clears throat> so um, the whole thing will be available um, if you if someone's missed this webinar catch up on it later thank you Anna so Teresa um, asks we are also housed in a building that is over 200 years old with dirt floors in a basement can this all be applied to that as well um, do you mean um, can this be applied to that, that type of building, or do you mean in terms of the dirt floors? Um, that, that will clarify it a little bit for me. Um, Greta says she's new to this. How frequently should uh, you swap out the N95 masks mentioned for smaller outbreaks? That's a really good question. Um, I would say more often rather than less often. They tend to, if, if, if you get any particulate matter on them, they should immediately uh, immediately be be tossed I would say even I would say even every day it just just to be on the safe side um, you don't want those kind of getting mold on the inside um, okay so Teresa says there are problems with mold in the dirt basement um, that is a tricky one 
it may be worth getting in a, a remediation company for an estimate since that's likely to be an ongoing problem if you've got a 200 year old building and a dirt um, dirt floor in the basement that's that's going to be problematic um, I also um, would suggest monitoring the temperature and humidity down there so that you can um, you can actually you know assess whether you need to deal with some sort of HVAC system or get in um, standalone dehumidifiers, things like that. Um, let's see, Greta asks if I have a brand recommendation for N95 respirators. I don't, 3M have good ones, um, but you can find them on lots of websites, uh, Uline or Amazon or um, really a lot of supply houses have them. So uh, Jason asks when drying documents is it best to let stacks of paper dry together? Um, is applying paper towels to stacks of wet documents or books recommended to absorb water? Um, <clears throat> depending on the paper, if it's if it's a paper that has stable media that isn't coated, um, things like that, that um, that you can let it dry in stacks. It will dry a lot more quickly if you can spread or fan those papers out. If you have any um, any sort of bleeding or running media or dyes or inks, um, if the paper seems unstable, if the paper is, is that clay coated paper, that shiny paper, um, those need to be separated with some kind of interleaving between them. So that, that can be a paper towel, um, it can be blotter paper, it can be newsprint, um, unprinted newsprint. Um, that's a good question. Uh, let's see, Brett says, we've had pushback at our institution about the difference between mildew and mold, that mildew is not as substantial of a risk. Um, both are fungal growths. Are there really any substantive differences? Um, that's a really good question. Technically, they're different species. So um, mildew is is a different species than mold, um, but you don't want it growing on your collections. It probably will um, cause some weakening of the structure. Mildew doesn't tend to spread the same way that mold does, but yeah, you don't want it in your collections. Um, you know, so that, that is a problem that you want to deal with, and that's a good question. Um, Greta asks, is all mold visible to the naked eye? Apologies if I missed this. Um, no, actually, um, sometimes you, well, often, actually, most of the time, you can't see the mold spores in the air. When, um, when mold actually lands and begins to grow, that's, that's when you, when you see it, when it starts, um, kind of becoming activated and germinating. Um, sometimes you might see a really small spot on something and that's where having a good magnifying glass or even with those cheap um, USB microscopes that you can get, you can get them for, you know, maybe $20 on eBay um, is, is a good thing to have so that you can look really closely and see if you can see those growth networks or the hyphae growing. Um, sometimes you just can't tell with the naked eye. That's a good question. Um, Brett, in terms of how you identify the difference between mildew and mold, um, I'm going to put my email address here, and if you want to email me <clears throat> with your particulars, I can answer that in a little bit more detail because it's kind of a kind of a complicated question. Um, I'm just putting my my email address up now, so feel free to um, to send me any questions if you've got photos. That also helps. Things like that. Um, are there any other questions? Any other? Any other questions about mold? My favorite mold species is uh, penicillin. Penicillium. <laughs> if anyone was wondering. Looks like there might be one more. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, if anyone does think of a question, um, feel free to email Diani um, or email me at the address that I've posted there, and I'm happy to answer any moldy questions you might want answered. Um, yeah, uh, one second, I'm just going to uh, have D put Diani on. Thank you so much, Jillian. I just wanted to um, wrap up really quickly. First of all, I wanted to apologize and for the uh, time confusion. I realized there was an error on some of your invitations, but since you all um, joined us, hopefully you 
got the, the message about the right time. If there's anyone who joined us while the webinar was going on because of that error or really for any reason, uh, please know that the entire webinar has been recorded and it will be available through our website tomorrow. So apologies for um, confusion there. I just wanted to um, thank everyone for joining us, remind you again about our next upcoming webinar and on March 22nd on preservation for historic buildings. And I actually, though, it looks like there might be one additional question for Jillian. So fortunately, we, we've we stuck around. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back to her, but definitely feel free to reach out to Jillian at her email address that she provided in the chat box there. Or um, you can always reach out to me. My email is on the RHSP section of uh, the CCAHA website. But um, I'm going to pass it back to Jillian to, to answer um, potentially this last question, but we, we do have time for more as well. So, just. Okay, so um, it looks like um, Jason has asked a question. <clears throat> Um, when freezing an object, is it best to wrap it in plastic? Um, it depends what it is. Generally, I would recommend um, wrapping it in um, wax paper, for example. Um, plastic might create a bit of a microclimate. Sometimes if you have a large volume of material that you're freezing um, and you work with a remediation firm, they might use plastic um, to keep it all together. But I, I tend to recommend wrapping material um, that you're going to freeze in wax paper. I think it's probably a little bit better for the object. Uh, another question, let's see, when removing items from the freezer, what is your recommendation for adjusting items back to room temperature without having condensation damage the items? That's a really good question. Um, so when you're removing those items from the freezer, it's to uh, hopefully immediately remove that um, those mold spores which have been deactivated. Um, if you have something which is going to be very sensitive to condensation, um, that is a good uh, candidate for um, vacuum uh, vacuum drying. So that's usually done by a remediation firm um, where they actually um, uh, sublimate the water. So they take it from a liquid state um, and evaporate it without going through that I'm sorry, they take it from a frozen state and evaporate it uh, to a gaseous state without going through a liquid state. So it helps to, um, you know, not not damage those materials. Another thing you can do is um, if you bring it out, you can put it in a plastic bag and allow it to um, kind of adjust back to room temperature inside of that bag um, for a few hours, maybe eight to 12 hours, but you do want to act fairly quickly to get that deactivated mold um, off of there. But yeah, if, sorry, that was a confusing answer, um, but if you are worried about condensation damaging the items, um, vacuum freeze drying is a, is a really good way to, um, to get around that. Are there any other questions? Okay, no more mold questions. Thank you so much for... Um, Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Have a great day.